Kia ora tato. Good morning and welcome to everyone. <clears throat> the business of the commissioners this morning is to hear the submission of Potatoes New Zealand. And uh, of course, we do welcome representatives of that organisation and we're looking forward to hearing what they have to say. We have, of course, read the submission that was originally lodged uh, earlier. We have uh, received and read statements of evidence in chief of three witnesses, four witnesses, I think. We have also seen uh, ma presentation materials that you have uh, kindly provided us with in the last few days including by Mr. Kirk Woodsett and Mr. Conlon and Mr. Oakley. Now, would one of you like to uh, explain to us uh, who, who's going to be taking part in what order and perhaps make a start with the presentation? Good morning, Commissioner. Uh, my name is Chris Claridge. I'm the CE of Potatoes New Zealand. I will outline who's presenting today and introduce the speakers in the order of the speakers. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present on behalf of the potato industry. The presenters we have for you today uh, John Jackson from McCain's, Stuart Hydes from McKeehe Fries, Charlotte Bowen from Hartman Chips. These are the three people representing the potato processing industry in Canterbury. And then we have three growers from Canterbury, Robin Oakley from Oakley's Premium Fresh Vegetables, Guy Slater from Critchell Downs Potatoes and Hamish McFarlane representing the McCain's Grower Group. The third and final group will be myself presenting an overview of the industry, our strategy going forward, followed by Dr Ian Kirkwood, our Potatoes New Zealand Technology Manager and then we have Nick Conland and Chris Keenan, our expert witnesses, who will be presenting <coughs> their material. We're happy to answer any questions at any stage during the presentation. And we hope to present a compelling argument that the potato industry in Canterbury is seeking an expansion Nearly growth pathway and a consenting pathway for our industry given our sustainable growth aspirations. So I'd like to pass uh, the speaking over to uh, John Jackson from McCain's who will give you an overview of his company and their activities here in Canterbury. Thank you, Mr. Claridge. Thank you and uh, welcome. And welcome also to Mr. Jackson. And uh, Mr. Jackson, I'm not sure that we've received any written material from you, but uh, please feel welcome to uh, speak to uh, the general topics. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you as soon as you're ready. Thank you. Um, so my name is John Jackson, I'm the Agricultural Director for um, McCain Foods in Australia and New Zealand um, and um, based out of Timaru but, uh, and haven't been in Australia for some time. Um, so the McCain Foods potato french fry plant in Timaru started production in 1993-94 season with seven potato growers supplying 14,000 tonnes of potatoes. This has steadily grown to processing 30% of New Zealand's potato crop um, 140 to 150,000 tonnes of potatoes now with 12 growers. Most of the original farming families still supply 
growing potatoes on the Canary Plains from Timaru to north of Rakaia. This, this equates to over 40 million paid to these families and farming communities for potatoes annually, which in turn then flows through the local economy. McCain directly employs 150 permanent employees plus seasonal and casual employees, with the growers employing in excess of 100 permanent employees for potato production themselves, plus 100 seasonal casual employees. In addition to this, McCain supports all of the other upstream and downstream local suppliers, service providers, logistics into and out of the Timaru factory on truck and rail to New Zealand and international destinations. McCain supplies French fries to all the major quick service restaurants, um, that is, like the, your um, Burger King and KFC, um, restaurant customers in New Zealand, as well as retail and food service in New Zealand, Australia, Southeast Asia. 30% of the McCain Timaru production is for domestic consumption and 70% is for export markets. The McCain factory has numerous audit and management systems, including environmental management system ISO 14001 accreditation. All of our growers are required to have either Global GAP or New Zealand GAP, which is Good Agricultural Practice Accreditation. McCain support commercial vegetable growing operations to operate at good management practice to protect their environment. The relationship uh, with growers, processing, investment, agronomy, R&D and um, the McCain Grower Group. McCain have a strong relationship with all their 12 growers who have averaged over 20 years supplying potatoes to McCain. All growers are contracted 100% for certainty of supply and quality and to minimise waste. McCain, global focus on agronomy is extremely important. Uh, we have always employed agronomists to work extensively with our growers for best practice and technology uptake to reduce our environmental footprint. McCain, along with all of our growers, invest in research and development through a fund, e with each contributing equally and funding for production improvement and best practice across the supply chain <coughs> in all aspects of potato production, including environmental sustainability. Sitting on this committee are McCain agronomic employees, potato process growers, independent industry agronomists, potato seed representatives showing the unity and drive of our group and industry to improve our sustainability. McCain globally has just launched a McCain sustainability strategy with targeted commitments, the pillars of smart sustainable farming, resource efficient operations, good food, strong ethics and thriving communities. McCain, has also, McCain is also a founding member of the like-minded industries who have formed the OP2B, which is One Planet Business for Biodiversity, strategy to increase regenerative farming, including soil health and soil biodiversity across the globe. Our global CEO, Max Cohn, said recently to the media, the benefit of having scale, as you put all those large, so as you put all those 18 companies together, we have about 500 billion in revenues. When we decide to do something, we can get the ball rolling in a bit, and hence, obviously, governments take notice. The, the, the rotation of land is vitally important to maintain the soil health, soil structure, water and nutrient holding capacity. Therefore, maintaining environmental improvements and increasing sustainability. In 2012, a project, Potato Report, PRF, SPTS number, 8706 and 8620 was initiated and funded by McCain, a growing community and others with plant and food research as the research facilitator to provide, um, to investigate yield limiting factors in potato crops including looking at fertiliser use, irrigation, soil structure, pests and diseases. The outcome of this research illustrated that farmers were using adequate amounts of fertiliser to match the potato yield. They are, they, are, they are targeting to produce. The focus, the, and the focus to make improvements was to improve soil structure and soil health by increasing crop rotation. In subsequent years, projects PRF, 
SPTS number 1011 and 11950, then focused on soil health and showed that the main factors limiting yields are the presence of soil borne diseases, inadequate irrigation management and compacted soils. This led to the extension of growers targeting a minimum of seven to eight year crop rotations between potato crops. Other crops in the rotations include wheat, barley, oats, processed peas, livestock, so grass production, rye grass, brassicas and other small vegetable seed production, clover, carrots, onions plus others. Therefore the ability for growers to move between nutrient allocation zones to access this land is vital for a sustainable industry and farming community and as shown has resulted in increased yields of potatoes over time. The alternative to long rotations is short rotations and going down the path of soil fumigation as happens in other parts of the world which leads to degradation of the soil biological health. A tailored approach is required for commercial vegetable production. If land with high production value is to be realised for its food production purpose and uh, uh, while achieving um, catchment wide water quality improvements and other environmental benefits in the long term, we support a sound scientific process to be used in the establishment of any assessment of nutrient losses on the Canterbury Plains. If you have low yielding potato crops, through limited water availability or short crop rotation length, you therefore need more area of land to produce the same volume of potatoes with the same imports, therefore a larger environmental <coughs> footprint would occur. An example of water requirement by crop. One kg, so one kg of potatoes requires 287 litres of water. So it's only one, to produce one kg of potatoes requires 287 litres of water. To produce a litre of milk requires 1,020 litres of water. One kg of beef requires 15,415 litres of water. <laughs> One hectare of potatoes can yield three to five times the quantity of grain crops. Potatoes are the fourth most important food crop in the world after maize, rice, wheat in terms of food consumption. And actually, when I first did some, um, some study, is that um, one hectare of wheat, in those times, it was one hectare of wheat could feed two people for a year. One hectare of potatoes could feed 29 people for a year. So, so, it's, so it's profound. Um, our, growers, our growers are contracted to McCain on raw tonnage volume. Therefore, area of potatoes grown is controlled relative to investment and expansion of, process, of processing facilities if this occurs. We support our collective. Uh, we support. Uh, we support our collective consenting model for processing potatoes in the Canterbury region due to the cohesive nature of our grower, grower group and the fact that we have a database on the soil types, fertility, fertilizer, water usage applied seasonally to the cropping area, linked to GPS locations and therefore historical records for the future. A cap in production would mean New Zealand potato production would become open to more competition from around the world and the global market and would become reliant on a level of imports. A cap on a future increase in growing area would mean a halt on investment and in capital for expansion of the Timaru plant and weakening our global competitiveness. The graph shows our increased yields over the last um, 10 Years increasing by. Um, so just want to go back a wee bit. Yeah, that just shows. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, shows a uh, shows an increase of twenty five percent. Sorry, is that on a graph? Yes. Yes. We're just trying to get it's it to work. Oh. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't see you. There we go. There's the graph there. Ah, there. So interesting, the um, planted the trend line over the over time planted area is actually versus the yield. So you see the yield is actually increasing. Our, our area that we require to grow potatoes on actually is actually um, uh, reducing a, a, as a parallel line because the, you know we actually are increasing yields over time. So we're we're getting we're seeing with what we're doing uh, our rotations and the way we're farming uh, a yield improvement, and obviously then there is there is less pressure on the amount of land we need. 
Um, so McCain Foods is part. So just um, look, McCain, McCain Foods is part of the global network of 51 factories around the world. A family-owned business um, owned by the McCain family. To remain efficient and to compete globally for market share, we will need the ability to expand our factory for volume and high yielding competitively priced potatoes and to ensure that continual capital expenditure occurs in Canterbury for the benefit of business, our farmers and community. Just to get Canterbury's potato production in perspective, um, so as a comparison with the Netherlands, so the Netherlands is 41,500 square kilometres. The Canterbury region is actually 45,000 square kilometres. Uh, the, the Netherlands, an arable farmland in the Netherlands is, is 1.3 million hectares. The Canterbury Plains are 800,000 hectares. So by comparison, so Canterbury is an arable land is about two thirds the size of the Netherlands in what we'd call arable farming land for cropping. So then the Netherlands have a short crop rotation by comparison and, and hence the graph that I showed actually over time shows that uh, are actually a, de a, a decline in yields over time because of short rotations. So, um, so if you just take the Canterbury Plains at two thirds the size of the Netherlands um, with equivalent farmlands, the Netherlands has 1.6 million dairy cows, and Canterbury has, um, and I looked up on the internet, 950,000 dairy cows. So, so a reasonable balance at so it's Canterbury a few for dairy cows would be Canterbury would be the balance with the Netherlands would be 1.1 million cows. Um, but then if you look at actually potato production, the Netherlands is 146,000 hectares in potatoes. And Canterbury is 7,000 hectares. You know, so Canterbury is, by comparison, is 6.5 percent of that um, area by comparison, just to show that you know the, the size of the, of the industry. The, the Netherlands actually produces 7 million ton annually of their potato of their potato crop, and Canterbury is 320,000. So Canterbury is circular 7 percent by volume comparison. So you know we're, we're tiny in, by comparison. You know, and, and, and a critical thing is our yields are higher, and our yields are higher because of our rotation and the way we're farming. An example, so an example of, um, of, of the company's commitment and investment in sustainability is the new solar ar array at, the, at our factory in Ballarat, um, where construction of a renewable energy system that will reduce emissions from the Ballarat food processing facility by more than 27,000 tonnes of CO2 per year. Um, the project, which will house Australia's largest behind the metre renewable energy system, will, will subsidise McCain's energy consumption in Ballarat by 39%. The 8.2 megawatt system uh, plans to utilise a combination of solar and, and co-generation technology. So just an, just an example of what we're doing in, in ANZ between Australia and New Zealand, what we're doing in sustainability uh, across our plants when we look at energy, the amount of energy we use, and, and, and so we've got a pretty strict timeline of, um, of, our, of reducing our environmental footprint. So thank you for this opportunity. Well, that was very interesting. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Uh, do you wish to ask any questions of Mr. Jackson, Commissioner Van Voorhisen? Uh, no, no, thank you. Uh, well, thank you for that interesting uh, presentation, Mr. Jackson. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. Uh, our next presenter is Stuart Hines from McKeehee Fries, from McKeehee, who will give you a another view from the production sector of potatoes in Canterbury. Well, welcome Mr Hines. Thank you. Thank you Chris. My name is Stuart Heights and I'm the operations manager of Makiki Fries. I'm relatively new to Makiki Fries and our industry having started four weeks before COVID lockdown when we lost about 85% of our sales. First, let me start by thanking you for providing us with the opportunity to come and present to you here today. We certainly appreciate it. In doing so, I fervently hope this is an old style consultation, where with the utmost of respect, we present our case and you listen. I mean that in the nicest possible way, I really do, in a way that means we have open minds looking to be influenced by good arguments and good news stories. For I have previously presented to hearings that have predetermined political agendas where I've walked away feeling like we were wasting our time. 
I'm sure that is not the case here. We certainly have high hopes for this particular process and what we are here to do today. I'm a little bit in awe of what John said, and I'd like to say everything he said, apart from the bits specifically about McCain's. <laughs> um, but let me t start take a slightly different tack. Let me t tell you a little bit, a little bit about myself personally. I grew up in rural New Zealand, mid Canterbury actually, just up the road. I grew up fishing, swimming, and enjoying our local river, the Ashburton. I'm not a farmer, so I'm not one-eyed. I took it for granted, and I thought nothing of it. It had always been there, and I thought it always would be. And in two or three short decades, I've watched that definitely change. Outside of work, I remain a hunter, a fisherman, and a duck shooter. And I want you to think of those things in the context of the indigenous peoples of Greenland, Alaska, and the Amazon, not in the context of Nordic warriors from Scandinavia. To be a true hunter imposes a strong moral and ethical code to definitely not be of a raping and pillaging mindset, far from it. Like all of us, I'm sure, it's not all about business and money, nor should it be. I'm sure we are all very concerned about the legacy, both economic and environmental, that we're leaving for our children and our grandchildren. That's why we're here today. I'm particularly passionate about preserving our uniquely New Zealand way of life. We are lucky enough to live in the greatest country on earth, but we are merely custodians it is our job to look after it and protect it. I have believed this since long before it was fashionable or common to do so. And I agree that not everything we've done, particularly in recent decades, has been well aligned with this objective. Personally, I have a couple of stupid personal rules. One is that I, don't, I won't work in competition to a previous employer, and that's stupid because it means every time I've changed jobs, I've had to completely change industries. Another is that I will not work in an industry that requires me to compromise my personal values and integrity. If there's one thing about being a hunter and a fisherman and a duck shooter that it means that I do is that I walk slowly and I stop and I think. I notice nature, I notice our environment and I notice our impacts upon it. Also, I write poetry. It may not be very good poetry, but it still requires me to think about what I'm saying and to choose my words carefully. I can honestly say I've watched the lowland rivers of Canterbury become degraded right before my very eyes. As a result of that, I've personally advocated against the harmful effects of agricultural intensification here in Canterbury. Dare I say it, mostly dairy, for that is what I believe has changed the most. I believe I understand the, the intent of Plan Change 7 and what it's broadly trying to achieve. Against all of this background, I can honestly say I'm proud to be here today representing our industry in McKiggy Fries. For ours is a positive, good news story in a positive, good news industry. There's no escaping the fact New Zealand, Canterbury and South Canterbury in particular, as far as we're concerned, relies on agriculture, food production. We're good at it. It's one of the things that has helped us through COVID lockdown and it will help us in our economic recovery. It stood in the face of government policy that otherwise shut down everything apart from essential services. We desperately need to rebuild our now debt-laden economy. We need positive, good news stories. Yes, we need to mit mitigate our negative impacts on water quality, particularly the effects of nitrates. I strongly believe in that. But we also need jobs. We need to limit imports and we need to grow exports. We need a strong economy. Today you're going to hear from my colleagues who are far more qualified to represent our industry and speak to you in terms of the technical side of things, so I'm not really even going to try and do that. My main message is to urge you to listen to our case, for I believe it is compelling and it's well backed by good science. Let me use an analogy if I may. Plan Change 7 is a net that is set to catch a real problem. It's a problem we undeniably must address. I 100% agree with that, but like all even good nets, sometimes they catch the wrong fish. As my colleagues will tell you in far more detail and far better than I can, in a world where we must have agriculture and the world needs food, potatoes are more part of the solution than part of the problem. So I'm here today representing our industry on behalf of McKicky Fries. Slide two. We're a small family owned producer of the world's greatest tasting all natural potato fries. And to, just to back that up, I'll read, give you, read you a couple of bits of feedback we've received just in the last couple of days. This is from a gentleman who says, my mum used to make the best fries in the world. 
Then I came across a 2kg bag of crinkle cut chips with your name on it in Pack and Save Westgate, Auckland. Cooked in my air fryer, yummy. Mum will be turning over in her grave at my comments. Please keep supplying them. Wonderful. And then from a, uh, a lady, just letting you know that your, your oven fries are the best by a long shot. My husband is a chip fanatic, but yours are the only fries we have in our freezer, freezer now. Keep up the good work, team. We consider ourselves to be, to be to the potato fries industry as craft beer is to the beer industry. We don't copy everyone else. We don't chase the latest fads. We don't mess with what is a proven recipe. We just keep on keeping on doing our thing. We're the minnow of our industry, the white bait. We're small and we plan on staying that way. But that doesn't mean we can't grow. And just now, we're poised for a bit of growth. We care about our environment. That's why we're carbon zero. We like to think we're the gold star of think local, buy local. We're locally owned, still by the same family that started us way back in 83. We employ local people, and when we say local, some live literally just over the road. I live 20 minutes away in Timaru, and that's further away than almost all of our team. All of our ingredients, there's only two of them, are grown right here in Canterbury. All of our products are sold right here in New Zealand. We don't export, don't never say never. We believe you simply can't get more local in an in industry than Makiki Fries. Next slide. <coughs> so I pretty much covered all of this. We were founded in 1983. We only use 100% agria potatoes. All of our ingredients are grown right here in Canterbury. We're locally owned and operated. We em currently employ 17 people, although this is at risk of increasing. And because of all of this, everything about us, including any profits we make, stay right here in Canterbury. Last slide. So our message is simple. We're a small employer, but we are very important in our small, rural South Canterbury community. We're just what our country needs, especially in these difficult times, as we strive to rebuild our now debt-laden economy after COVID-19 lockdown. And this is a process that hasn't even really started in earnest yet. Although we're a small player, the craft beer of the New Zealand potato fries industry we're well placed to play a bigger role. Please don't let Plan Change 7 be the limiting factor. In closing, let me once again urge you to listen to our case. What my colleagues who have already spoken have said, and what those who haven't yet have got to say, for potatoes are a mitigating crop, and well backed by good science, ours is a positive good news story. The future of Makiki Fries will be one of growth, provided we let it be. I hope you have a good day, and thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you, Mr. Hyde. It was, it was interesting, and of course, it's all uh, laying the foundation for the improvements to Plan Change 7 that Potatoes New Zealand will be urging upon us. Commissioner Van Vaught, do you have any questions of Mr Hyde's? No, no questions, but I do need to confess that we have some of your fries in our freezer at home too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You've done a great piece of salesmanship. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Hyde's. Now we have Charlotte Bowen, is it? Yes, Commissioners, we have Charlotte Bowen from uh, Hartman Chips who is joining us next. We'll just arrange for her PowerPoint presentation. So. And, and while she's doing that, would you just say again where she's from because I just missed hearing that. Uh, Charlotte Bowen from Hartland Chips. Hartland Chips, thank you. And the other presenter from Heartland Chips is uh, Duncan McLeod. In your own time. Okay, good morning, Commissioner, and thank you very much for allowing us to have this opportunity to uh, speak today. Um, thank you, John. Thank you, John and Stuart. Also, your presentations were very good, and um, mine may not be quite up to that standard, but 
I guess my main message today that I'm going to be um, sort of portraying is around business growth and supporting local industries to grow and employing local staff. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of an outline around um, Harley and Potato Chips. Um, go to the next slide, Chris. So we're a manufacturing facility which is based just on the outskirts of Timaru and Washdyke. Um, I've got up there that we operate five days a week from 4am till midnight. Um, we've actually just turned 10 years old and when we first started 10 years ago in 2010 we actually were only operating three days a week um, and we only employed around five or six staff members. So the growth that we've had over the last 10 years has um, certainly changed. Um, we now employ a lot more staff and you can see that our hours of operation has certainly increased. Um, the reason that Fourgate Farm Company slide has just popped up um, is because we're a family owned company. Um, my parents actually own the company and they own Fourgate Farm. So the reason that Fourgate Farm slides popped up there is because Fourgate Farm is the, actually the only um, farm that we source our potatoes from. So we're, in, we're actually a vertically integrated operation right through from the paddock to the packet. The farm is only located um, up the road in um, Arari, South Canterbury and their main block um, is 1,500 hectares sorry, with, very, with other various locations um, in the region. As I mentioned, um, it's a family owned and operated business, so my father and mother still live on the farm and my brother also, um, James, grows the potatoes along with Dad and we work really closely with um, Duncan, who I've got up here beside me today, who will speak a little bit more around the farming side of it um, and he's the farm agronomist. As I mentioned, when we started 10 years ago, we only had five different SKUs of products and now we're on the shelf, we've got 26. Um, we employ 16 full-time staff, but like anything, um, there are seasonal times and Christmas certainly is um, an area that we need to boost production. So we employ another eight staff um, to increase production. So that runs a second shift, so therefore um, that puts on, well sorry, we employ that second shift for around eight months of the year now. So um, certainly growth has has arranged for that demand, um, so it's increased over the years. We supply all main um, supermarkets throughout New Zealand within foodstuffs and progressive, um, small independents also, and we export a small amount. Um, with this growth though, we look to increase um, our export opportunities um, as it comes about, but we've also got certainly got growth that we can um, increase within New Zealand. I've just put a wee slide up there just to show you um, the tonnage of potatoes used by Heartland and this is just over the last five years so you can see that um, the graph has incrementally um, taken steps up. The last graph on the end in the green there is only just what we've used this year so that's only up until last month so you'll see that that will um, increase also. I've probably over, over, over <laughs> covered a lot of this here. Um, so 10 years ago we were entering a market that we had no idea what we were, what we were getting ourselves into I guess and we had 0% market share. Well today we've now, we're now holding 10% so that is still growing. Um, we are the second biggest um, player in the South Island behind Bluebird Foods and so what I'm trying to say to you here is that we are a small company, we are still in growth. The more that we grow as a company the more people we are going to employ and the more potatoes that we are going to be growing within the region. So I'm going to now hand it to um, Duncan, who is going to. Sorry, I'll, sorry, I will outline quickly a little bit about Fourgate Farm. So Fourgate Farm is an agricultural growing of cereal and potato crops, um, as well as winter grazing of animals. Um, on the farm, they employ eight full-time staff, and like, <coughs> excuse me, um, any farming operation, there is seasons where they need to employ more staff during potato harvest and grain harvest seasons. Um, my father starting off farming over 50 years ago and he's grown from nothing to where they are today. Um, there is areas on the farm that they need to um, lease land and so Duncan will talk a little bit more about that also and um, obviously we supply other outfits and Makikahi, Stuart just spoke before, is in another um, industry that the farm supplies. Take it 
Well, Ms. Bowen, thank you very oh, much. Sorry, no, I haven't finished. I'm just moving it on. Sorry, we're just waiting for the next slide. <laughs> um, so, Duncan's now going to speak a little bit about the, um, the farm. Yeah, yes. so I just have the um, privilege, privilege of working with um, the Bowens with uh, their farming operations. So, not just with the potatoes, but with the rotational crops as well. So, just wanted to um, just briefly outline that the potato crop, while it's quite simple and there's actually only 100 days that are really important, as uh, John from McCain mentioned, the rotation, it generally is in probably six to seven years worth of planning goes into um, a very short and but highly valuable uh, crop that nothing is taken for chance. So um, right from the planning, the soil sampling, when we're planting, making sure we've got the right varieties in the right soil type with the right irrigation potential, um, all the way through so that when we come to harvest the potatoes which are then placed into long-term storage that when they enter the factory they're actually going to be fit for purpose. So although while it sort of starts out quite a simple concept, I'm going to grow some potatoes make some chips, there's uh, quite a lot of science and effort that goes into making sure that um, yeah that what we've got is what <laughs> we need, or what we need is what we've got. Um, yeah, so there's not nothing taken for chance, as I said before, with the, um, especially around nutrition. And yeah, over time we've just, although we've got a framework, every potato has its own specific programme. And one thing I would say that is with my time looking at potatoes, which is about 20 years, I've definitely seen um, <coughs> that we are getting better and better at managing the nutrients and the the direction that the plant breeders have actually moving towards and going towards is actually having more efficient potato plants and uh, better efficiency at utilising water and nutrients and although that moves quite slowly that there is a definite trend uh, in that direction. Um, I just, Charlotte touched on geographical spread so this is um, the, where the potatoes are sourced, the um, four-gate farm are growing. So although the farm's centrally located, we are growing potatoes um, in Seadown, which are quite close to the uh, factory, uh, out Tamukia, we've got Arari, Geraldine and Coldstream. So all these have different soil types, um, rainfall and irrigation systems, and we'll be placing potato varieties in these locations and soil types to maximise their potential but also to, um, just with the next slide, Chris, uh, this was a significant event that happened last um, December, I think it was, November, uh, where uh, if, you know, the, um, uh, when a storm came through, a hailstorm, and if the grower had a not very good geographical spread or potatoes with their crops in one location, then they would have had um, well, you can see the bottom picture there that the hail pretty much defoliated the potatoes. And although they grew back last year, it was probably just the time of year that that happened. We've had the, the, the risk of these storms is, is all summer, um, so something that might happen later on in the season would be more devastating to a grower if they were only restricted to growing in one um, place. Um, as I mentioned about soil types, and that's important, and we um, and also reliance on different irrigation schemes, so the reliability of water to make sure that we can um, produce the potatoes, well, yeah, safeguard the potato supply. Uh, that's the end of the presentation from Charlotte and uh, Duncan. Uh, if there are any questions that the Commissioner has. <coughs> No, no questions, <clears throat> but I didn't have a copy of that PowerPoint pre-circulated to me, so if we could have that provided via Tafisha, that, uh, that would be good, thanks. Not a problem. Well, th th thank you, Mr. Claridge, for an interesting uh, presentation. So those end the presentations from the processes, and now we'd like yes. to move to uh, having presentations from growers who represent uh, both process crops and also fresh crops for the supermarket. So process growers that supply processes and a grower that supplies supermarket chains throughout New Zealand. So the next presenter we have is Robin Oakley.
who join us, who's traveled down. Got your microphone close to you. Just one moment okay. while we organise his um, PowerPoint presentation. Yes, I think I think we we also have a copy of that. Right. Just while you're organising that. Um, I'm Robin Oakley. I'd just be interested to know who a lot of the people are on the other side of the room. I know most of the people on this side, they're all the good people in our potato industry, and just wondering who, who you people all are and who you work. <laughs> I know we've got the two commissioners, and... Um, we're council officers, so my name's Philip Moore. I'm a member of council for the Count team. Uh, Tim, my immediate right, is Andrew Edwards, uh, who is a lawyer who works with me, and is also advising the council. Further on this side, we have uh, Alicia, who's the uh, Hearing Administration Object Officer, uh, and Olivia Cook, who is assisting the uh, Hearing Panel as well. Okay, thank you. Now, Mr. Oakley, we have um, a copy of the presentation I think we're going to give, and uh, we wait for you for letting us have that in advance so we've looked through it. Now, please, uh, when you're ready, just uh, proceed to uh, present please it tell for me us. When you want to move this slide. Right, oh, well, that's me. Um, so, yeah, we'll just move on to the next slide now. Okay, so. I'm a fifth generation potato grower in Canterbury and yes yeah, so I'll just read to the notes so fifth generation growing potatoes in Canterbury uh, this year we were recognised by the Balanced Farm Environment Awards we won three of their awards which were largely around um, nutrient um, management with the crops that we're doing and soil management and innovation we're operating on 450 hectares of land and you can see a big percentage of that is leased and we are growing 350 hectares of that as actual vegetables and a big chunk of that is potatoes and our area that we're growing potatoes on is quite spread around Canterbury we've got our first early season out on the Kaitaruti spit and from there we move through Southbridge, Kalinchi, Dunsandal, Greendale, Horada, Darfield, and we're also growing at Ambley up in North Canterbury. The vegetable crops we do are quite labour intensive, so a lot of the broccoli, for example, a lot of hand harvesting. Um, we do a lot of our own, we do all our own washing and packing on the potato front, so we've, we've got a pack house that we're running to supply 52 weeks of the year and employing pretty much 45 full-time people, but there's more people there at busier times of the year. Uh, me personally, I've been commercially growing for 35 years and plan to be doing it for a good while longer yet. And I've got a daughter who's involved in the business at the moment as well, who's, who's keen to carry on. Um, so on the potato front, we are mostly supplying the domestic market for fresh and our main customer is Foodstuff South Island. So we do a lot of their house brand product in the South Island, and we've got some of our own branded product, the you know, Golden Gourmet Potatoes, and they're supplied throughout the country in all the Foodstuff stores. We do a little bit of export fresh market. We're supplying broccoli all year round, beetroot all year round, and grey crown pumpkins from April to November. And we have, on our own land, about 100 hectares a year of break crops that can be anything from maize to grass, uh, a bit of maize as well. So the environmental side of it is really where it's all at. And sustainable agriculture is something that most people in New Zealand are quite aware of now. Um, we've been aware of that for five generations here in Canterbury. It's nothing new for us. And one of the interesting things I find with 
the whole environment sustainability side of things now is we've got a lot more technology now than what we've had in the past, so we can actually do a lot more measuring. But if you go back 10, 15, 20 years, we didn't have a lot of that technology. We didn't have all the measurements. So you kind of had to do it by the seat of your pants, but you weren't stupid. In inputs in any crop are expensive. There's a lot of hard work and effort goes to growing a good crop of potatoes. So you soon get pretty tuned in to what you need to be doing to grow that good crop. And one of the things you learn pretty early on is, is potatoes is about rotation. So in our case now, we've, we've spent a lot of, we've invested a lot in, in a lot of areas around um, genetics with varieties. We've invested a lot around um, seed storage. We've invested a lot around um, seed treatments and how we can grow the crop, plant spacings, populations, how we cultivate the ground. We've, we've done that to the nth degree and we're still doing it and we're still learning. But one of the most important things that any potato grower can tell you is the thing that makes the biggest difference is, is your rotation period. If you can get into fresh ground, you'll get the best crop. There's, there's no two ways about it. You'll hear plenty of that today from, from the different people. Um, we're doing washed potatoes and it's all about skin finish. So we might be able to grow a big yielding crop of potatoes, but the consumer wants a potato that's got a nice pretty skin. And someone mentioned earlier on about soil borne diseases. They, they can impact the yield and some of the physical quality, but the biggest thing they do is, is or one of the significant things they do for our business is, is skin finish. And if the skin finish isn't good, it goes into a lower grade of potatoes. And obviously, and, and the, those soil borne diseases do have a direct impact on, on yield. And if you're growing and looking at sustainability, the most important thing is the yield per hectare that you sell. So if you're selling less per hectare, you need more hectares to grow on and you've got a bigger environmental footprint. So that, that's a big focus for us and being on fresh ground, really, really important. Um, if you're on fresh ground, there's a lot less um, need for a lot of extra inputs and sprays. Um, we've already talked about the potatoes and the amount of water they require, so there's, there's no debate that potatoes are probably the, one of the, the single most important food sources globally that we, we need to make sure we, we don't stifle the production going forward with a growing world population. Um, we've got a lot of scientific data that they're going to bring in today around nitrogen leaching in potatoes. The data that they've got now is not a surprise for myself. Um, over the years growing potatoes, you observe what's happening in the crop and you soon get to know what crops are deficient and which ones aren't and you get quite in tune with, with what the crop needs are. And with all the crops that we grow, with water and nitrogen, they, the, they have the two components have, that have the biggest influence on, on outcome of yield and quality. And too much of either of those is just as bad as not enough. So you've got to keep the measures just right. And it's interesting when we put, we've been using moisture probes now for about eight or nine years since the early on when they came on the scene. And one of the things I found quite interesting, because I didn't have a lot of faith in them to start with, so I thought I'll buy one and see how it goes and we put it in our first potato crop and up until then I'd been assessing the moisture going out to the paddock with a fork and having a good deep dig down in the ground and assessing the moisture with your hand and it was, I was quite shocked or surprised actually to see how accurate those moisture probes are in measuring the soil moisture and I would say that I was probably, my calibration, what I thought the crop needed and what the moisture probe was saying were, were very much aligned so I think it highlights what we've been doing in the past and what we're doing now, that the science and the technology we've got is, is, is pretty aligned. Um, yeah, so we'll move on to the next slide. So future opportunities, we've got growing population. Potatoes have had a bit of bad stigma over the last number of years. Um, more people eating rice and pasta and other such things, but I think there's a lot more learning now that potatoes is... is is definitely the best food to be eating um, and I see that demand for our products only going to increase and the importance of 
being able to get onto fresh land or have long rotations between land is probably one of the single most important things for us environmentally mm -hmm. going forward. Um, you know, not saying the other things are a given, that they're there with, with moisture management and crop management, but getting onto fresh land is the single most important factor for us to be more sustainable. That about covers it from me, if anyone's got any questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Rightly. That's a, that's a help, helpful and interesting description. Uh, Commissioner Van Voorhuizen, any questions for Mr. Oakley? No, no questions, thank you. Cheers. Well, thank you, Mr. Oakley. Thank you for coming in and uh, for preparing it, and thank you for the uh, slides that you sent in for us in advance. Mr. Slater, is it? Yes, uh, thank you, Commissioners. Our next uh, speaker is Guy Slater from Critchell Downs Potatoes, who's also a potato grower, a uh, grower that supplies processors. Uh, Guy would like to come forward. And then the next uh, grower we'll have following him is Hamish McFarland, representing the uh, McCain's growers. Well, good morning, Mr. Slater. Thank you very much for coming to tell us what you have to uh, present. And uh, when you're ready, we're uh, ready for you. Um, hello, my name is uh, Guy Slater, as stated. Uh, Potatoes New Zealand have submitted on behalf of the potato growers across Canterbury. I'm here to help you understand what they're asking for and more importantly, why they're asking. While I support their submission, I believe total flexibility around land use classes is needed. As well, I'm here to help you as commissioners and decision makers give clear guidance through planning law without compromising environmental outcomes. <coughs> My physical residence is Geraldine. I'm a third generation farmer and farm in partnerships with my father, Roger. It is an arable operation where we have been specialising in growing American and European turf type tall fescues for the sod lawn market. We are also a shareholder in the farmer's mill in Washdyke. Our farm produces wheat that is milled there to make flour. The flour is used primarily to make biscuits and bread for the internal market. A significant point to add here is our home block has an effective area of 558 hectares with a very low environmental footprint. <coughs> we are fully irrigated with 32 litres a second, 20 hectares of plantations. Grass stands down for up to five years. We catch a significant winter runoff in ponds to irrigate in summer. Baselines in the 20s, winter no livestock, have a consent to farm, and are lastly unable to grow potatoes, as the soil type is too heavy to allow. It's a good story, exactly like my potato operation. Few will have the ability to get their heads around this, which is slightly sad. I'm married to Jane and have three children aged between eight and 13, two girls and one boy. A major goal of mine is to give my children the opportunity to farm as my father did for me. If any of them have the desire and drive to go farming, a succession policy has been implemented. Jane and I own Critchell Downs Potatoes. Critchell Downs owns 50% of McFlynn Potatoes. The other partner in, in McFlynn is sitting with me here today and is about to speak next, I think. Critchell Downs was born in 2004, McFlynn in 2013. Forgive me if those dates are incorrect by one year in terms of production or company status. I've been dealing with potatoes all my working life. I started work after achieving a BCom at Lincoln for a potato processor at Fairton in 97. 
first as a rep, then moving to field manager. 2004, I started growing for tallies. The first year, I grew 129 acres in four paddocks. My contract was 3,600 tonne. The paddocks were all share farmed with four farmers, three of which I still work with today. One has moved to dairy. To do, today, the group has grown its farmer base to nearly 30 farming families. All potatoes are grown on leased land. Although we do own two small blocks in Mid Canterbury, my business has been totally built around my founding growers and still is today. We're extremely grateful to our growers as without them we would not have a business. Today we currently plant 50 paddocks a year. Our group tonnage this year will be north of 51,000 tonnes. My two companies and the home farm have an annual turnover of $15 million. The market has changed drastically, but the model within the company hasn't. Our focus on yield and quality is the primary focus. We continue to focus on producing, producing potatoes for French fries cheaply. Hamish and I, with McFlynn, are a significant supplier to McCain's here in Washdyke. Critchell Downs, major customers is Tally's, with three or four other smaller customers including Proper Crisp and Nelson. Small volumes are exported for risk management purposes occasionally. Actually here today I have, <coughs> still do, or am starting partnerships with all speakers presenting, excluding one. Though small in size, Robin Oakley and I have an idea regarding outer season production, which could be very exciting going forward for Canterbury. Basically, my business is all about people, my team beneath me, and I stand on very broad shoulders. At this point, I'd like to make special mention of the Potatoes New Zealand team, Simon Binney, my operations manager, my two fellow directors, Jane and Hamish, my digging contractor Grant from Kinsman Contracting, my key permanent staff, my father, my office administrator, and just as importantly, the managers and ag managers at McCain's and Tally's, my two key customers. There are also contract staff taking care of engineering, fertilising, and we have th three spray teams to support the ship. Second to people was land availability and the right to obtain that land. Land and region selection for outcome is critical. Why this is critical is we need outcomes that are certain as possible in terms of risk management for our buyers. We're starting early, sorry, we start planting early potatoes in the last week of August until the 10th of September in Seafield. The reason for this is the Lismores can be got on and worked at a difficult time of the year. We then move to slightly heavier ground in Wakanui. We are conscious we need to get good yields here but have the ability to get them out clean as well. We then move to Eiffelton in, in, in late September with what I call earlies. This is heavy ground with some clay. The key here is to have them out by the 15th of March before storage starts or the weather breaks. We have three planting teams that involve three planters including two six rowers and five de-stoners. Around the 1st of October we plant for storage. We keep one planter in Seafield and send the second planter to Hines and Westfield in a circuit. The reason here is when you go to higher ground, above 80 metres but below 300 metres around Meffin, we need to have hit our midpoint planting by the 15th of October as late planted at high altitude will mean immature potatoes that don't hit target yields and qualities for the customers. Around the 28th of October to the 7th of November, we aim to finish Russet Burbanks and Innovators for storage. During this date, we come back to lower ground in Seafield to ensure finishing. After the 7th of November, we plant agri for storage in sheds or even ground storage for digging in June. We target as it is warmer, has good irrigation, and is closer to market we aim to have all potatoes planted by the 20th of no November. We have a large geographic spread 
than most because of the following reasons. We are a larger operation than most. We're always looking for clean ground. This will give you eight tonne free yield. To spread the risk in terms of hail, frost, dry, wet, pump and water restrictions in one area. We need to future proof our operations. We, we want correct varieties matched with region soil types and target yields. Our digging months have been touched on but we dig between January and June. After the 15th of June, the processes get fry discoloration due to decreasing ground temperatures. We cannot afford any potatoes not hitting the market. We regard this seriously. With 50 paddocks, our profit margin will be in the last three to five, depending on their size. Margins are close than tight, but this is another matter. If we begin leaving potatoes in the ground, lease arrangements, with farmers will be strained. Environmental management has been where the big gains have been made. Let's touch <coughs> on that. In my first year we watered a russet Burbank paddock 15 times. Obviously a dry year, total applied water 600 mil. Last sea, season, average applied water on the same variety on the same, at the same farmer's place was around 30 times. We only applied 370 mils. Yields on the paddock in my first year equate to 75 tonne to the hectare. This year they were around 70. The reason for the drastic drop in water was the system had been changed from a high pressure rotorainer to a centre pivot on a low pressure system, allowing more frequent and smaller quantities of water. Today we measure everything we can around watering along with our buyers agronomy team I have two agronomists that are capturing information they are in the paddock two to three times a week we're doing this for two reasons for crop health reasons but secondly please understand we need to catch every movement in the paddock because the process insists we do so from a crop diary perspective but if we are share farming with our client, any movement involves a cost to be captured, as we're in a partnership. Along with irrigation, cultivation, planting, spraying, fertilising and digging, every <coughs> square metre of the paddock will see 52 actions completed. The crop costs $17,000 a hectare to grow, making every action cost on average $320 per hectare. If a russet Burbank crop has emerged for 130 days, that equates to 18 weeks. The team, as previously mentioned, will view the paddock at least twice a week. The view times will be an exact match of the actions executed. We have captured every action with a view, and that is what I call measuring, viewing every action but most importantly, having the ability to ask the question if it is needed. Our drive is to reduce our footprint, like we have done with watering by 10% with chemical and fertiliser applied. The driver here is twofold, A, to reduce costs by $1,600 a hectare, and B, to reduce our active ingredient or nutrient level by the same. Economic and environmental sustainability run hand in hand. All I'm saying is I like breaking problems down. They become more achievable to solve. Regarding nutrition, we specifically match target yield with NPK, meaning varieties with lower yields will receive less inputs. We soil test every paddock. We band all first phosphorus with the seed piece at planting. The processes or company does PTLs to measure nutrition through the year. We have applied a just-in-time approach when addressing N, meaning we only apply if needed. Further to this, we know exactly how much N a potato plant needs a day and provide it to them as they bulk. When it comes to magnesium and potassium and sulphur, we front load this 10 to 30 days after emergence as the biomass of the plant the plant generates is early. Extraordinary when it comes to 
measuring potassium. Remember, I do not own the land. I specifically want to put down exactly what the plant needs, although this is difficult when considering P. I often do self-check soil testing after the potatoes are removed to compare those results with starting tests. It's amazing how precise the program has got when considering we are removing 80 tonnes of product per hectare, around 550 kgs of K. Our aim is to hold the soil test the same after removal, excluding pH. We have evidence to suggest we are doing this. We are now applying less N than we ever have, dropping N at planting. We are now at a stage we put more N on our wheat at home than we are on our potato crops in mid Canterbury. The companies we operate within have a relatively low profile in many ways, so to speak today, here today, is a big deal. It has been discussed that to get outcomes we must table evidence if the status quo is not acceptable. I am not sure where this process is today in terms of finalised law, but I raise my hand and ask to be heard. Further to this, I would ask to help shape outcomes going forward for my operation and secondly for the potato industry as a whole in, in the wider Canterbury region. I have high aspirations and plenty of opportunities in this amazing sector. We want to be ahead of the curve in terms of outcome and the only way to do this is to know what the curve looks like. <coughs> I hope that has been explained a bit today. All I'm asking here is Please don't tell me how to do it, when to do it, where to do it, and how much to apply, as we have the answers already. Please can the potato gro Canterbury potato grower be exempt? I am able to table any, any evidence required or answer any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Slater. Thank you for coming in and giving us that uh, full description of your situation or what you wanted to tell us. Commissioner Van Voorthuizen, any questions for Mr Slater? No, no questions Mr Slater, but I see you were reading from some notes. Can you leave a copy of those with our administrator just so we have those available to us? Yep. Yep, so that's why I wasn't writing much down because I was going to ask for your notes afterwards. Thank you, thank, thank you for you. listening. Uh, the next... Cool. Yes, Mr Slater, um, I, I was making notes, but I'm sure it would be better if I've got the full notes that you uh, were reading from too. And uh, But I was making notes because I, was, I like that my colleague was interested in what you were telling us. So thank you for that. Now I think we uh, will hear next from Mr McFarlane, is that right? Yes, you will. Yes, thank you. Do you have a PowerPoint? Uh, there is a PowerPoint. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just... Just organise the PowerPoint. Good, thanks. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just, it's just pretty much. <laughs> I'll use my judgment. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, kia ora, so, Judge. Thank you for coming in. Just tell us who you are first and then uh, proceed, proceed to uh, speak to us. Oh, thank you. My name's Hamish McFarlane and I'm representing a group called McCain Growers Unincorporated Society today, which we refer to as muggers or mugs depending on how you're feeling. Um, oh, anyway, kia ora, and, um, and um, I hear condolences for uh, Commissioner Solomon, who's away today. So um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. today. Um, my name's Hamish McFarlane. I'm a member of the committee that administers muggers. Um, I'm also a potato process grower for McCain Foods, who I supply through McFlynn Potatoes Limited, which is a company owned by Guy and Jane Slater and myself, and obviously Guy has just spoken to you. Uh, for some background, I've made a separate submission on behalf of McFarlane Agriculture, McFlynn Potatoes and myself, 
and I ask if you could please take note of some of the points made in that submission which I've tabled um, with Commissioner Van Boersthausen. Um, I'd like to refer to the original submission on PC7 lodged by Muggers in 2019 and assume that we can take that as read. And today yes. I'll just, oh thank you, thank you. And today I'll just be speaking to some key points from this um, and endeavour to answer any questions you may have. Um, please feel free to ask any questions on photos or points I make as we proceed or at the end. So Muggers is a self-funded group dedicated to research and development for the benefit of the potato industry and sustainable ag. Memberships made up of McCain Foods and all the farmers who supply the Timaru plant. The committee that administers the society consists of farmers, McCain staff, seed growers plus independent agronomists. Funding of the group is equally shared between the growers and McCain, which results in a significant yearly spend on science and just um, that's roughly around about 300k a year without any external funding added onto that. Muggers represents the largest sole supply group of processed potato growers in New Zealand. The group has a history of achieving clear results for both growers and processor through delivering economic and environmental gains as a result of the R&D carried out. Membership farmers grow approximately 2,000 to 2,000 to 2,200 hectares annually for McCain Foods in an area encompassing Timaru to Darfield. More often than not, an individual grower will have paddocks scattered over 100 kilometres plus. The six to 7,000 tonnes of potato seed required to allow this to take place each year are also mainly sourced and grown in the Canterbury region. Mainly by separate growers who have specialised in this field of potato production. As an entire group, we grow across many different nutrient allocation zones and source water from multiple water schemes and sources. As a group, we are heavily reliant on all parts of our supply chain performing in order to operate into the future. Some key considerations when making your decisions around the environmental management of potato growing in Canterbury are Future expansion is realistically limited by commercial reality. Produce is all contracted, it has to have a home, and there is no requirement for McCain to accept uncontracted volume. Potatoes that don't meet quality specifications are not paid for. Crops that are overwatered or fertilised will generally fall out of specification. Therefore, a successful operation becomes self-regulating to a degree. Potato production has a very high cost structure, which results in major spin-off for the community beyond farm gate and processor off a relatively small area. Due to the high cost, any efficiency gain achieved through minimising fertiliser or other inputs is significant and therefore a goal for every grower and processor. On the flip side of this, excess nutrients in water often have the effect of reducing quality and yields and therefore returns to the grower. We are under co constant commercial pressure to perform and exceed international expectations. We can only achieve this through lower inputs per tonne of product. This helps meet the needs of PC7 planning expectations. We recognise that our international markets require us to meet environmental standards and we recognise that our country needs us to. As a group we are committed to achieving these. We are conscious that measures put in place to achieve planning outcomes have to be real and mitigate our environmental footprint. Land used for potato production can't be used for potatoes again for six to eight years, therefore placing a limit on the area any landholding can sustainably produce. The infrastructure investment, whether it be seed, transport, storage or machinery, is significant in comparison to most other types of farming operations. There are few new entrants to the industry due to the complexity and the risk and requirement for contracts, but the industry does need them. There are enough barriers 
to entry without requiring historic baselines. Canterbury process growing is not the same as winter table production in Pukekohe and should not be treated with a one size fits all solution. And to touch on it again, potatoes are one of the most efficient food producing plants known to mankind. All McCain growers are Canterbury based, family owned and operated businesses. The McCain Grower Group employ roughly 100 permanent staff and another 100 to 150 seasonal staff in Canterbury for potato production. All existing growers are also involved in other diverse farming operations which work in with or alongside potatoes. Generally these are based around traditional mixed cropping and livestock with some operations also growing onions, berry fruit or dairy. These farms support a multitude of other local business sectors such as science and tech, research, consultancy, engineering and building, transport, compliance and resource management. All of these operations must meet Global GAP or New Zealand GAP certification. This means they must meet standards around ethical treatment of staff, accurate recording of products, inputs and abide by applicable, applicable environmental legislation. These certification schemes are renewed annually and audited at least every three years. This is in addition to the current land use consent requirements in Canterbury that ensures strict adherence to nutrient management under GMP and recognising current environmental and cultural practice. Farm environment plans are required by irrigation schemes or consents. Now often potatoes are grown on leased land. The ability for a farmer to lease a percentage of land to a potato grower for reasonable return and zero business risk without the investment in labour, machinery and infrastructure allows many farms to continue with a traditional mixed operation. This is as opposed to converting to another type of farming that offers less diversity. Most leases are for the length of the crop only and are made up of a base price per hectare plus a fee charged per mill of water applied per hectare. This fee for water is a direct cost on the grower's bottom line. Another direct cost of over applying water is rotten or out of spec potatoes that are not paid for. An inch of water applied at the wrong time can result in a quarter of your product not making grade due to internal defects or rot. If I can give you a brief intro to the crop and some of the challenges faced, and I'm sorry you'll hear some of this a few times today, but we'll get you there. Generally processed crops and uh, potatoes in Canterbury are planted from mid-September to early November and harvested from mid-January to the end of May. The irrigation season is relatively short and sharp, with applications generally starting in mid to late November and ending in February. Water restrictions or irrigation being cut off on a potato crop can lead to significant yield, quality and environmental problems in most Canterbury summers. For example, if a 70 tonne per hectare crop is targeted as realistic, then nutrients are applied accordingly. Most of these have to be applied at the start of the season. If certain factors impact growing conditions significantly, this crop could be reduced to 50 tonne per hectare or less in the blink of an eye. Some of these factors are limited water, reduced rotations, which results in disease pressure and potential requirement to fumigate. Location, processed potatoes don't perform at the higher altitudes and inadequate or poorly timed nutrient inputs. This lower yielding crop would generally have the same amount of cultivation, use the same amount of seed, chemical and fertiliser, have the same number of sprays, have incurred the same costs of land and other overheads, potentially generate lower payment per tonne for quality not being reached. On the flip side, lower transport costs at harvesting and lower irrigation costs through not being put on. Those costs would be the same as a high yielding crop. The consequence of the lower yielding crop of potatoes is a larger environmental footprint per tonne due to leftover nutrients and higher carbon emissions at, com at completion of crop and long term more area required to grow the same volume. Reliable water is a key component here and additionally <coughs> provides resilience to the potential effects of climate change. Reliably storing potatoes from March to December to allow for year-round French fry production requires good quality potatoes, 
experience, plus quality sheds and climate control. Excess irrigation, high disease pressure, short rotations or incorrect fertility can cause significant losses during storage. Growers and agronomists therefore use various soil moisture monitoring systems, sampling and assessment in the field, plus rigorous attention to weather forecasts before applying water to ensure the correct amount is applied when required. The same level of attention is paid to nutrient levels and introduced fertiliser. As stated previously, fertiliser is expensive and when used in excess often results in lower returns, quality and yield. It can lead to increased vegetative growth, reduce the growth of the potato tuber and result in high moisture potatoes that cannot be processed. All of this comes with a penalty to the grower and the processor. A lot of work has been done and is ongoing to manage nutrient inputs for potatoes. Some of these examples are the potato calculator, by the hectare soil testing and variable rate applications, PDL testing which is leaf samples, real time nutrient probes being introduced, drone and satellite monitoring. While no one of these tools can offer a catch all solution, the combination of some or all of allow us to fine tune inputs and mitigate adverse environmental effects to the best of our ability. Alongside these examples, there is a constant search by Muggers and McCain for more efficient varieties of potatoes that can grow more from less, but also meet buyer expectations. In conclusion, in conclusion Muggers would seek the following outcomes. The flexibility to choose soil types and locations that are the best fit for the timing and type of potato crop we are growing. Flexibility to work across farms, catchments and zones to prevent overloading any one of these. Simplicity around the rules when working in different catchments and zones. The ability to use input modelling systems that accurately reflect nutrient use of a potato crop. The opportunity to sustainably expand a crop, which is incredibly important for food security and also has a rel relatively low environmental footprint when farmed correctly. This has to be done in a way that respects the spirit of Te Manaro Te Wai and aspirations of PC7 outcomes. Not have existing suppliers, new entrants or possible opportunities limited by historic and irrelevant baselines. The ability for our member growers to work collaboratively with planning authorities at a catchment level to develop workable, reliable and environmentally positive outcomes for our water resources. Investigation into a collective consenting model for the industry and involvement if the opportunity arose as a result of these hearings to help form rules or policies for the plan. Thank you for your time. I appreciate the hard work you have ahead. I'm sure you've listened to our concerns, but also our pride in being part of an industry that does have the tools and ability to sustainably continue farming into the future. Nā mihi. Hamish. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr McFarlane. And uh, I, I entirely understand you're, you're speaking of the pride, which is obvious amongst uh, all of the people who've spoken this morning and it's a, an impressive part of the presentation of, of the group as a whole. Does it, do you have any questions of Mr McFarland, Commissioner Van Bortesen? Yeah, just two uh, matters I'd like to ask you about. Just on um, the third page of your uh, speaking notes, you mentioned uh, leftover nutrients. Now, we've heard evidence from Mr Kirkwood and Mr Conlon about n nutrient leaching under the crop when it's in the ground. But in terms of leftover nutrients or residual nitrogen, what can you tell us about the effect that has on um, nitrogen leaching from subsequent break crops that are planted after the potatoes are harvested? Can you just rephrase the last bit? So on the subsequent break crop, so, yeah, so, so you, after the potatoes yeah, been so harvested. So you harvest your potatoes, then you yep. go into break crops. We've yep. heard about wheat, barley, oats, grass, etc. Yep. So what impact does the potato growing and harvesting for that one year have on subsequent end leaching? Um, to be fair, I, I think generally the soil will be quite strong in, um, in your potash and phosphate levels. Um, 
and generally if you've hit your target or close to your target then there shouldn't be a lot of end left in the soil for that subsequent crop would be my read on it and um, I'm happy to be corrected but, yeah. um, okay. and maybe um, I'm not at all clear who it is that's speaking at the moment. Yeah, you shouldn't uh, be just... I wonder whether we can just have a bit of order. Yeah. Uh, I'd like that only one person at a time is speaking. And at the moment, Mr McFarlane has the floor to be answering questions from my colleague, Commissioner Van Bortles. If, if other people would like to contribute, they will have the opportunity in their turn. But it's the way that we work, that we have one person at a time and that we know who it is that, that, that is making a contribution. Now, uh, please, please would you re return to your uh, answering questions, Mr McFarlane, that's good of you. Yep. No problem, apologies about that. Um, so generally, um, most arable farmers will do what they call a deep soil end test um, for their cereal crops or, or whatever. Um, and and I, I stand to be corrected, and every year is a wee bit different, but um, the general nitrogen level from a deep soil end test after potatoes would often be um, lower or very similar to a standard arable crop. All right. Thank, no, thank you for that. And maybe when Mr. Collins or Mr. Um, Kirkwood, when uh, you come to present, if you can add anything to that from a technical perspective, I'd appreciate that. Uh, uh, the second question. issue, uh, Mr. McFarlane, you, on the last page, you talk about historic and irrelevant baselines. By that, do you mean um, baseline GMP leaching rates that are uh, imposed in resource consents, or do you mean the baseline area of potato slash vegetable growing that rules talk about? Correct. I'm talking about the latter that the you latter. mentioned there. Yes. Okay. Yep. 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 Um, and, and just for interest's sake, um, the company that I'm a part of wasn't, and it was born in 2013. Right. Yeah. So um, that just shows you the impact that, that that rule could have on a on a company that's ended up being quite a key supplier. Mm. Yeah. All right, now thank you very much for that. No further questions. Thank you. So, Mr McFarlane, you had some notes that you were speaking to. Is that right? Yes, it is, yes, and I've given some copies to the front table here. Um, so oh, they're available for you guys whenever you want them. Yes, thank you. That would be helpful to us. Thank you very much for coming in and uh, presenting to us. Uh, it's time for a short break and uh, we'll resume again in 15 minutes. Oh, thank you very much, appreciate your time. No, 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 you're fine, absolutely spot on. <laughs> no, you're fine. Just thought I'd give you a overview of Potatoes New Zealand. Uh, you've heard from uh, three of our Canterbury processors and three of our Canterbury growers who supply processed potatoes and fresh potatoes to the New Zealand Pacific Islands and uh, through the through the processors uh, supply wider to some 40 different countries. But just some background on who Potatoes New Zealand Incorporated is. We're a commodity levy order group a little bit unusual uh, when compared to other commodity levy order groups in that we represent both the growers and the processors. So we represent the seed merchants, the 172 growers, uh, the 14 exporters. Overall our industry is worth some billion dollars a year. We've got three key growing areas. We've got Pukekohe and Waikato and then the Horizons region, which is Horafanua, Manawatu, and then Canterbury. And as you heard this morning from John Jackson from McCain's, 
This is an important figure as the 320,000 tonnes of potatoes grown in the Canterbury region. We'll come back <coughs> to that figure to explain the importance of Canterbury to the potato industry. Now in 2013, the industry as a whole set three goals. That is to double the exports by 2025, and our current growth is around about 16% since then, and also increasing domestic value by 50%. We're currently on target to hit that, in that we've achieved 44% growth in domestic value since 2013. We've added an additional goal of setting a zero net emissions target by 2050. And as you heard this morning from Stuart Hines from Makihi, they've already achieved zero carbon emissions. And you've heard from other growers who are now cognizant of carbon as well being important. So these are the three goals that underpin our industry. We have 172 growers producing half 500,000 metric tonnes from approximately 10,000 hectares. As you heard this morning, some two-thirds of the production is the Canterbury region. In fact, if you take the Ashburton district, that represents 50% of the entire potato crop for New Zealand is grown in that district. So the capital of potatoes is Ashburton. <coughs> Almost 70% of the entire crop is processed to frozen fries and crisps, and you heard that from Charlotte Bowen and Duncan McLeod from Heartland, who told you of the potato crisp factory based in Washdyke, and you've heard from Stuart from McKeehe and John from McCain's. As I said earlier, the entire industry is valued at around $1.1 billion. We generate around about $130 million of export earnings each year and we have eight, 80 growers in Canterbury growing over 5,000 hectares a year. Four processors, two seed merchants. Now, it's an important point here, 95% of the entire potato seed production is in the Canterbury region. And once processed, potatoes generate significant export earnings on a per hectare basis, some $36,000 per hectare. Potatoes grown in Canterbury are shipped to Auckland and to Wellington. There are processes, of you, as you've heard, growers, here, growers presenting this morning said they supplied processes in Nelson, and also Auckland, Auckland processing facilities utilise potatoes grown here in Canterbury. The industry needs to have access to approximately 10,000 hectares in Canterbury to achieve targets and to maintain our capacity. We need access, because of the extensive rotations required, some 50 to 100,000 hectares, and you'll hear this expanded on by Ian Kirkwood and Nick Conlon. We know that there's significant opportunity to increase production and processing in this region in a sustainable manner, so therefore the industry is seeking an expansion pathway which is consentable, and you've heard growers express an interest in collective consent models. You've also heard growers express to you a concern about the baseline of 2013. And in one case, you had one presenter, Hamish McFarlane from Flynn Potatoes, tell you that they came into operation after that baseline date. This is a significant supplier with significant grower with significant economic impact if that grower was subsequently removed What you'll hear from uh, Ian Kirkwood and from Nick Conlon and Chris Keenan is that we've developed science that supports our evidence. And the assessment of potatoes in an intensive rotation, we believe, has overestimated the impact of extensive potato rotations. And including potatoes in an extensive rotation reduces the nutrient load and attachment in our belief. The industry has undertaken its own research, funded its own research, to dir create direct evidence of very low levels of nitrate emissions below crops, and Dr Ian Kirkwood's evidence speaks to that. 
The industry has a very good positive relationship with Overseer and we're working actively with Overseer to increase its uh, accuracy in terms of measuring and predicting the nitrate leaching from potatoes crops and also potatoes in rotations. And the industry in association with other vegetable product groups is investing over $7 million in the next four years on establishing nitrate emissions from vegetable crop rotations and we've got scientific uh, monitoring happening here in Canterbury plus a research site uh, with plant and food where we'll be undertaking rotations and measuring directly the emissions from those crops. We believe that we are able to show quite clearly that potatoes are a mitigating crop and don't present any risk if an expansion pathway is developed for the industry. What I have put up in front of you is a slide which utilises uh, the Horizons Council's experts and staff, which was from their Section 42A report, which shows their projections of nitrate emissions from potato crops under current production and also GMP or even to best management practice. And what you can see is significantly low levels of nitrate leaching from potato crops. What we will present as well as the evidence that shows that this these projections from overseer, overseer correlates well with our own evidence that has been produced for us by plant of food. So we see a real opportunity for a sustainable growth and for potatoes to be given a pathway for growth that allows us to mitigate nitrate emissions from other farming activities. As you heard from growers, we utilise leased land extensively in Canterbury, so therefore having a, a pathway for expanding <coughs> crop production enables other farming activities to reduce their nitrate emissions. Another critical factor, as you will have heard from both the processors and the growers, and they're, they're deeply intertwined, the processors need certainty of supply in order to undertake investment. Therefore, having a long planning horizon of consentable activity allows the processors to make investment and know that they're going to get a return and know that they're able to get raw material for which they can develop offshore markets. And this becomes a virtuous circle where the growers can then subsequently invest in their own operations. Because what the growers have told you is they have contracts with the processors. This is not a spot market. So therefore this is a sustainable economic growth model which lends itself very well given the light of the environmental impacts. So that gives you an idea of the industry as a whole and the importance of Canterbury to it. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Well, thank you very much, Mr Claridge. Do you have any questions for Mr. Claridge, Commissioner Van Dorten? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, thank you. Just a couple of questions. If you could just put the slide back up where you had the horizons um, in leaching results. Just want to clarify um, two things. So the rotations you have there, they exclude potatoes, do they, except for the fourth one in, which has cauliflower potato? Correct. Okay. And then the first one is potatoes only crop, so that would just Correct. be for that one year? Yes. And just can you explain to me a little bit more about original, what that means, and then GMP, what that means, and how GMP was derived on, you know, ECAN has a farm portal which you can put um, land use activities through to generate a, a GMP figure. How was it derived in Horizons, do you know? I'm happy to supply that as supplementary evidence <laughs> okay. um, from the Horizons staff. 
yep. which details uh, how they derived uh, GMP and BMP figures. Yeah, yep. so just yeah, information on what original means and then how did they get to GMP and BMP. Thank you. That's all. Well, Mr. Claridge, I do compliment you on the preparation that you've gone to and the way in which you've presented on behalf of Potatoes in New Zealand. It's interesting and clear and helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, up to uh, Dr. Kirkwood. Just one moment while I prepare his slides. Yes, just take the time. Okay. <clears throat> now, my name's uh, Ian Kirkwood. I'm the technical manager with Potatoes New Zealand. My areas of responsibility with the organisation is research and development, biosecurity, and seed potato certification. So I'm going to talk primarily today on the work that PNZ is currently doing on nitrate emissions in potato crops. I've titled my uh, presentation Measure, Monitor, Manage and Mitigate. Um, and that's kind of the order that we're taking, if you like, um, in terms of our approach to this issue. Uh, thank you. That one there. Okay, thank you. Um, Chris has already explained our one of our strategic goals being a net uh, nutrient emission, net zero nutrient emissions and greenhouse gases by 2050. Uh, I won't reiterate that, I shall move on to how we hope to achieve that. To be able to achieve it, we've instigated a series of R&D programs. Um, firstly, to develop methods to actually measure nitrate leaching from potato crops, that was the first step. Um, we've uh, contracted um, plant and food research to carry out a series of replicated field trials, which they've completed now for potatoes. That was at the Lincoln site. Um, in that trial, they used four different nutrient nitrate um, application rates and two different irrigation rates. Now, the purpose of this uh, trial was really only to collect data to validate or develop new models um, to predict nitrate leaching. I think there's perhaps been some confusion that it was a measure of current practice. These are not measures of current practice. These are, are, are replicated field trials solely for the purpose of collecting data um, to develop or validate the overseer model, develop new models or validate the overseer model. In addition to that, we run a number of sites, five different regional sites throughout New Zealand, two of which um, are in Canterbury, were in Canterbury, sorry, um, in the Ashburton district. Um, and there we were measuring actuals, the actual amount of nitrate that was leached from commercial potato crops. In addition, we haven't yet done that, that was just done last year. We'll run the overseer model on those regional sites to see how the overseer predictions match up with the actual levels of nitrate leaching from the or nitrate levels, I should say, from those soils. One thing we very quickly realised in this trial is that we can't just look at potatoes in isolation, clearly. Um, potatoes are part of a wider rotation. Um, so we've carried on the monitoring of those field sites into the subsequent crops. This is just uh, an aerial view of the, the trial site in Lincoln, the replicated plots, um, the four different nitrate uh, treatments and the two different irrigation treatments. Um, we'd like to sort of open the opportunity for any of the commissioners to come and view this trial site if they wish. Um, if they do wish to come and view it and look at some of the results, we're more than happy to uh, facilitate that. So very briefly, the results out of PNZ 79, this project, um, was that we got very low levels of leaching out of the potato crop. Um, we measured this leaching using suction cups. Um, the, the levels of nitrate leaching ranged from zero uh, up to 10 kilograms of nitrate per hectare. 
so very, very low levels of nitrate leaching. And that was including the very high um, nitrate application rates. I should add that um, the highest nitrate application rate is two times what would be considered as normally as good management practice in a potato crop and was in incorporated in this experiment purely for the development of the model, not necessarily to measure the amount of nitrate that was leaching out of the crop. So these results that we're getting out from the field <coughs> trial, this particular field trial, very closely resemble what we're the predictions we're getting out from Overseer. So our, our calculations from Overseer are very, very similar to the, the levels of nitrate that we're seeing coming out of the, the, the field trials. Um, on our um, actual field trial, the, the one in Lincoln, we haven't yet run Overseer on that. Um, that we'll be doing very shortly. So we'll have the results from that fairly, fairly shortly. That uh, crop has now been harvested and is now moved into a winter wheat crop. Pro this project has now morphed into a much larger project. Um, it's now called SVS, Sustainable Vegetable Systems Project. As I mentioned earlier, we realized that we really need to look at potatoes as part of a rotation. So we've now uh, moved to a much larger project. Um, it's funded both through levy funds from a number of different uh, commodity groups, which you can see on this slide, um, as well as a grant from MPI. So it's now a $5 million project uh, over four years. So this is the monitor phase, if you like, of the, of the project. Um, the SVS project's broken into four separate work streams. Um, work stream one is equivalent of what I've just shown you at the plant food trial site. Um, there will be further replicated trials going through a range of different crops, vegetable crops, over the next four years. And this will be to run, uh, or to, sorry, to collect data to help validate overseer or improve overseer, or if we're finding overseers not working to develop additional modeling systems. Work stream two, which is equivalent to the five sites that I mentioned previously, we've now got nine regional sites throughout the country where we'll be doing regular measurements in a range of different potato crop, uh, vegetable crops, sorry. Um, and this will be a, a, to help validate whatever model we develop, hopefully the overseer model um, that we're, we're working on in work stream one. Work stream three is all about the development of models. Uh, we'll be collecting the data from work stream one um, and using that to, to hopefully validate Overseer or possibly develop other models. Workstream 4 is more about managing nitrate uh, emissions. Workstream 4 is the communications and extension part of the project where we'll be taking the results from the other work streams and extending that out to growers and, and to industry. Firstly, we hope it will provide the industry with the tools that they can use to, to measure nitrate emissions. Secondly, we hope that it'll also help refine and perhaps improve some of the good management and best management practices that are being recommended to the industry, which will ho hopefully help further reduce nitrate leaching from crops. The mitigate part of the, of the program um, hasn't started yet. Um, we're looking at um, developing a series of agricultural practices that we might be able to further reduce nitrate leaching from potatoes and other vegetable crops. We intend to, to extend the project looking at other nutrients. Probably phosphate will be the next one off the, off the, off the list. Possibly also looking at carbon emissions. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're looking to be greenhouse gas uh, neutral by 2050, so we're going to be in investigating the use of, uh, of carbon sequestration into soils. Another idea that we're, we're moving forward is the idea actually came out of the UK, this one, um, of the use of demonstration farms. In the UK, they call them spot farms, um, where we can actually showcase some of these mitigation strategies to growers um, and help um, adoption of these new practices. I just wanted to also, before I finish, uh, re-emphasize the importance, I think you've been hearing it all, all day so far, but I just wanted to re-emphasize the importance of crop rotations. 
I think most of the growers and the, and the, the processors have been emphasising it, but I'll just re-emphasise it if you, if you like. Um, in Canterbury, approximately 60% of potatoes are grown on least ground. That might actually be even slightly higher than that. Uh, and the average rotation, as we've heard from most people, is ranges between five and eight years. And it's critically important that we maintain that long rotation. I'm actually a potato pathologist, so hopefully I understand why the, the, what the importance is of long rotations, the build-up particularly of soil-borne pathogens. Chris has already mentioned that um, Canterbury grows approximately 95% of the seed crops for New Zealand, it's a critical component of the, of the potato industry. Now they're looking for even longer rotations. Um, ideally, seed growers are looking for virgin ground. Where they can't find virgin ground, they're really looking for a minimum of a 10-year rotation. The, the seed scheme rules insists on a minimum of five, but no seed grower that I know of is growing on as little as five. They're really, really effectively, the minimum is a 10-year rotation for a seed crop. So the rotations and the ability for us to move to new ground is critically important for the potato industry. So I just wanted to re-emphasize that. All right, that's all I have, thank you. Well, Dr. Kirkwood, in addition to the uh, series of, sli of slides that you've presented now, we've also had a statement of evidence from you. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, would like to acknowledge and, and thank you for that as well. Okay. And uh, I'll see if my colleague, Commissioner Van Dorthuizen, has questions for you on either or anything else that you might uh, assist us with. Yeah, thank you. Just um, one issue I'd like to ask you about, and it relates to the attachment to your evidence in chief, which is the PNZ 79 report. Yeah. Have you got that available? I don't have it in front of me, but I, yeah, I'm familiar with it, obviously. Okay, well, we'll test that. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> just looking on page 29 of that report, which you don't have in front of you, um, you talk about the leaching under the potato crops. Uh, being sorry, can I just correct? This isn't my report. This is the report out of plant and food research. Are you able to speak to that report? I, I'm familiar with it, so hopefully I will be able to, yes. Okay, so on page 29 of that report, it talks about the leaching under the potato crops being um, the highest amount being 10 kgs, and I think that's similar to the numbers that you have in your PowerPoint presentation, yep, zero to 10. Um, further down, though, on, on that same page, it talks about um, soil mineral end data measured at final harvest had amounts ranging from 43 to 177 kg of end per hectare. Yep. And that highlighted the potential risks for winter end leaching, so that's the issue. I, um, I hinted at in yep. terms of question to one of the former speakers. So what can you tell us about that? How does that compare to what you might normally expect to see in the soil under a arable rotation? And what does that mean for subsequent leaching? Yep. The soil end tests at the beginning of the trial were 39 kilos per hectare, I believe. OK. Um, so if you look at the increase in the levels of mineral N, for the um, first three nitrate levels, that was 0, 100, and 200. The amount of residual mineral N in the soil was actually relatively low in comparison to the 39 that we started with. I think the highest, I believe, from recollection was 60. Well, it says here 43 to 177. Yeah, if you, there's a different part of the report, I believe it, it mentions couldn't tell you the page, I'm sorry, I don't have it in so front I'll just of me. Go from the summary section right, of okay. Report. Yeah, I think further down it mentions the different levels of the different treatments. Now, that 170 was the, f I, I believe, is the, f or I know, was the 400 right. uh, kilos of nitrate applied, which is, is unrealistic. Sure. Um, and it is, as I say, double good management practice. So how would you describe in lay terms the amount of residual end that you might expect to see compared to normal 
or, or a, a non-potato arable crop? Yeah, the difference with potatoes to an extent is the fact that they're underground and you have to disturb the soil so much to actually get them out of the ground, uh, mm -hmm. and that releases a lot of N right. from the soil. So what follows the potato crop is critically important. Um, the most common following crop in Canterbury is winter cereals, or our winter cereals, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, they're one of the best crops for mopping up residual nitrogen. Now, if you look at the international literature, it suggests that the timing of that uh, crop is critically important. If you get that winter cereal crop into the ground immediately following harvest, the majority of that nitrate can be can be picked up. Now, that's exactly what we've done in the trial, but we don't have those results yet right. because okay. it's still in winter wheat. But the international literature suggests that the majority of 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 night mineral N released by cultivation can be taken up by mm -hmm. that uh, winter crop. Okay. So if that occurs, uh, would a safe assumption be then that that wouldn't increase the risk of N leaching compared to other forms of arable farming? Is that a going on conclusion? Yeah, before? going on international literature, that that is what they found as well. Okay. Yeah, it, it mitigates that amount of nitrate that's released by the cultivation. Okay. All right, thank you. So that's all, Commissioner Shepherd. no further questions for Dr. Cook. Well, Dr. Cook, but you've gone to a lot of trouble to prepare your evidence and your exhibits and also the PowerPoints and uh, you've done it in a, in a clear and easy to follow way. It's interesting information and thank you for it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Nick Conland. Thank you. You'll need a mic. Yeah, okay. Ah, and here's your slide team. So just one for me. Yeah. Do you want to walk up? Uh, tēnā korua, uh, Commissioners, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I've, as you'll have in front of you, uh, uh, my um, expert evidence, and I'll take, yes. that, I'll take that as read today, um, just to provide a um, summary. I've put some slides which contain in the main figures from my evidence, and um, I'll run through that and... Um, to draw your attention to um, what I hope will be some helpful points. Thank you. Um, um, Commissioner um, Ben Boyhouse, I'm not, I'm not sure if you want me to just follow on in terms of your question from the earlier speaker. I can either do that first or at the end. Um, <coughs> you do it when you think it's best to do yeah. it. Yeah, okay, thank <laughs> you. Um, so, in terms of what, what I guess I was asked to do in a, in a higher narrative, I was focused by the team around me and before me speaking today around what what does a sustainable growth pathway look like and is this manageable within the Plan Change 7 proposal and the existing regulatory environment in Canterbury. And so what I did is I zoomed in on the um, the nitrogen allocation zones and um, what I've got here in the slide is the coincident areas where there's the highly productive soils as you'll see from my evidence and the um, nutrient allocation zones and so in the main and um, I also note there was a very good slide with a similar graphic in fact better than my one put up by um, Hamish McFarlane as well so you'll have that in your notes so just looking in on what is available, just as a way of saying where, where does the footprint um, lie, and I've just chosen two districts, 
close to us here in Ashburton and another one um, I'm quite familiar with in Selwyn, just to give you a sense of the scale. So between those two we've got respectively 65,000 hectares in LEC 1 and 2 in the Ashburton district where we are now and um, an equally, whoopsie, an equally <coughs> large area in LEC 1 and 2 in the Selwyn district. And um, in total, across the Canterbury region, we calculate from the um, council's data that there's about 290,000, give or take, hectares of LEC 1 and 2. Now, um, at, at some simple mathematical levels, just in scaling, and um, I'll take the numbers from, um, we heard from John Jackson from McCain's, at a 7,000 hectare industry today, if we look at that expansion, it would give a ability for a fourfold increase at a one in 10 rotation. And if it was a um, more conservative rotation, as I've modelled for one in six, I also, as you'll note, looked at one in five as well, it allows for up to a sevenfold increase. Now, does that also equate to something that's tolerable in terms of the effects? And so what I've done is I've, um, I've borrowed on the expertise provided to Council for their nutrient modelling, and I went back to the agribusiness group and said, can we look at um, a style of rotation that instead of in the intensive one, as was included in the um, Council assessment, to one that's more aligned to the growers you've heard from, to, I guess, to work with the issues they have around productivity and the pathogens that Dr. Kirk would talk to. And so what we have is, um, well, what I've done here in the slide on the table on um, the left, I've just looked at the introduction into um, what we're looking at is the analogues for the LEC 1 and 2 in a range of climate zones onto dairy, dairy support and arable. And um, what we find is that there's some, some leaching values there which are a reduction. And I've also looked at a sensitivity analysis for the Lismore soils. And the reason I've done that is though, although they are um, in the current footprint of growing, um, where they're um, unmodified, they tend to be a little bit lighter. So the potential for risk of leaching is a little bit higher. Now, what I've done then in the table on the um, right hand side is I've examined what the, the, the net effect is to introduce an extensive potato reduction onto an arable system or a dairy support system. Now, that's the, the middle line and um, apologies in the evidence if I didn't annotate those tables. Um, but essentially that middle line provides the net um, decrease or improvement in the load. So the load reduces by um, those numbers. And I've put a sensitivity analysis for, a, I guess, the bell curve of practices and also the flexible or the, the, the changes in the climactic conditions across those areas. Now, um, that's, sorry, I've just clicked forward to introduce the one for um, the dairy support as well. So I'd also just at a high level, just circling back to um, what are the freshwater outcomes and are these LEC one and two soils important to the overall objective of improving the freshwater outcomes. Now I've covered this briefly in paragraph 66 and 67 in my evidence, and what we're looking at here is this histogram on the right hand side, um, the lowland areas, or the, I guess the spring basins and the areas where there's primarily the potato production, um, are the areas where there's um, existing load shift requirements in the NASAs, and therefore I'm just extending the observation that in these catchments, with a reduction in the NAS load, we'll see the potential for an improvement in the visual outcomes. And um, that's the end of my um, slides, and probably just 
going back over um, where I wrote some notes, um, Commissioner, perhaps the only thing I'd add to the conversation that, or the information you've had from Dr Kirkwood already is there's clearly a difference between um, the residual end and the end leached, and um, there's some, as you'll understand, some important petitioning there, and I've covered that in my evidence in paragraphs 56 to 62, but effectively you've heard from the agronomic view from Dr Kirkwood that as a as an opportunity for a forage crop or a following crop, there's a nutrient source, but also a proportion of that is volatilised, and um, that's built around the concept of end surplus, and obviously a fraction of that is leached. And um, it's not my area, but I'm um, sure that Dr Kirkwood or um, Mr Claridge could talk to it, but some of the internal mathematics as over an overseer has changed certainly since people like me started working with it many years ago, and what that's meant is that the, if you like, the fundamental equations between the added nitrogen and the removed nitrogen are a lot better aligned. And what we're seeing that now is a verification between the modelling results that I've produced and the physical results that are contained in the plant and food research report. And um, it's extremely useful from a scientific perspective. So um, I'll leave you there and um, invite questions, and um, thanks for that opportunity. Yes, thank you, Mr. Conland. Questions, Commissioner? Yes, uh, thank you. Just first thing, um, my version of the um, PowerPoint presentation that was pre-circulated and had slides three and seven didn't have anything the pictures are in there, so <laughs> yes. if you can recirculate one that is complete, that would yeah, be great. Uh, apologies for that. Now I just want to go back to um, these tables, because I'm still not quite understanding what you've presented, and if we can maybe look at the one on page six of the PowerPoint presentation, is that the one up there? Is that one there? Yeah, yeah. So I just want to clarify my mind, so the left hand table, you've got some leaching results, so I understand the average column, what's the minus S1 column? Um, so, so that's where I've looked at the soil type, which is the Lismore soils, mm -hmm. and um, what I did is I removed it, um, Commissioner, just for a sensitivity analysis, okay. and um, the reason I did that is um, I know from experience and also just looking at it from a modelling perspective that it is um, generally a bit bonier mm -hmm. or has stones and they create um, two issues in respect of um, the leaching outcomes. They have less soil retention, uh, sorry, moisture retention in the soils, mm -hmm. and um, if you like, vector pathways yeah. around the stones for leaching. So I, I took them out um, just in case it was asked, but um, I also have um, from personal communications with um, Dr. Kirkwood and some of the growers, and you heard it today, I actually noted it in terms of um, efforts for stone de-stoning machinery, mm -hmm. that these soils can be improved. And I um, know from our colleagues at um, Lanky Research that you can ask for your soil to be reclassified as well. Sure. So just in lay terms though, that column is, you took out the Lismore soils because they're sort of a bony, leaky soil and that might have skewed the results. So is that fair? That's right. Yeah, okay. yeah. So now going to the, the one on the other side of the page. So the baseline row, so the middle row of three, is what happens when you introduce potatoes into those um, land use activities at the different intervals of rotations that you specify at the top, is that correct? Yep, that's yep. right. So that, that, that the baseline is the um, arable rotation as provided by Dr Kirkwood and what I used for the modelling and that is the, the relative reduction on um, all arable systems in a nitrogen allocation zone. So, sorry, just to clarify further then, so if I look at that um, one that's on screen now, and so the top right hand cell, potato rotation on a five year dairy support, mm -hmm. so does that mean you've taken a dairy support land use and you've introduced a potato crop every five years? 
Yep, that's correct. And that produces an 11% reduction in, in leaching on average, does it? For the load, yeah. For the load? Yeah. Okay, yep. and then your sensitivity analysis, just explain the plus and minus 15% again. Yeah, so so this, I guess the in this in this table, or the one that is on the screen now, this uh, sensitivity analysis is, I guess it's a little bit two dimensional because the second table is um, taking the lismore soils out. Yeah. And then the plus or minus 15% is a um, factoring for I guess what, what I'd call the bell curve of practices and in terms of GMP yep. and also climate variability. Yeah, so just explain what that means. I'm still um, so, Okay, what so, so what, what I've done is I've said that um, across the, um, the arable systems that the climate... Um, contour or the ISO heights, the amount of rain they get in all arable systems across Canterbury isn't the same. Yeah. So what I've done is I've allowed for, I guess, a, a rainier or a drier range by going plus or minus 15%. Okay. So the plus 15% row might represent a higher rainfall than in the baseline? Yeah, that's is, correct. And is it just rainfall that you varied or...? Well, uh, yes, it's it's rainfall in the in the in in the modelling. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks for clarifying that. Yep. Thank you. Right. No further questions for you. Thanks, Mr. Conlon. There was something I wasn't uh, quite following in your original evidence statement at page ten. You see, you've got figure three there. Uh, yes. And it's, the description of that map is highly productive areas in each NAZ. Is that right? Um, that's correct. What I'm not clear is, how does this map delineate the NAZs? Um, so I've how, just, I, how could I understand the map in that respect? Okay, so um, Commissioner, I've reversed my slides to um, put it on the screen in colour. Um, in the one I've got in front of me, I've printed in black and white, so it's a little bit more challenging to see. Um, so what, what this map is, is based on the Canterbury um, Maps portal from Council and it contains the mapping for each of the nutrient allocation zones. And so they're the coloured polygons that you see from the north to the south of Canterbury. And then... The uh, I'm, not, I'm not seeing that. Just, just explain to me what you're referring to as the coloured polygons. So... Yeah, so they are, is this a pointer? Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm not sure if you can see this as kind of <laughs> an attempt at technology, apologies Commissioner. Um, oh, again, again, um, I'm, if you've got a coloured, a colour printed version in front of you, or you can see the one on the yes, screen. Yes, I, I, ha I have on a, on a separate screen, okay. on the third yeah. screen, I have the coloured version uh, in, in your original statement of evidence that was presented to us a few weeks ago. Yes, and now what I've done is my figure three is also the same as a slide up on the screen, and um, I haven't named and numbered them in this, but I can, I'm happy to provide that in supplementary evidence if it's helpful, and they contain the as-mapped um, nutrient allocation zones from the council um, planning portal. Now, if they are incorrect or need to be adjusted, I'm happy to go in and make a correction there, but that's literally the information that I had available to me from the council planning site. And the overlapping black polygons 
as you can see in that figure, the one on the screen or in my evidence on page 10, are uh, the lumped LUC um, 1 and 2 areas. as I understand it from the, um, the mapping data that we have. So, that, so that, uh, yeah, from, from the LINS data, Commissioner. So you know we're trying to conduct a public process in which other members of the public can take part as well as uh, Potatoes New Zealand and its expert advisors. I was thinking for myself of the position of somebody who perhaps isn't technically qualified, but who is exercising their, what should be their right to understand what is the evidence that is being presented to us, to enable them to decide whether they wanted to get some other expert to come in and give rebuttal evidence. And I'm not sure how such a person could understand this particular figure three to be able to make that decision. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I entirely understand your point, but perhaps if it is helpful, I'm um, happy to um, adjust the scale of that figure because I do... I think Take the this. time has long since passed now. The mm. time for, for, for putting in rebuttal evidence has long since passed. Yes, well, I guess the, just imagine, the... just imagine a person who's a a lay person interested in the process and looks at figure three. How would they know what those black areas are supposed to represent? No, and not, how no. would they know what the green areas are supposed to represent? Because I don't. No, I take your point. It's good feedback, and um, thank you for that. Well, that, that's the only other question that I, I wanted to ask of you, Mr. Conlon, and uh, I want to thank you for your expert evidence and for contributing to this uh, seeking of information that we've got. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. Thank you for your questions. Um, commissioners, our last speaker uh, today is uh, Chris Keenan. Yes. Um, A very warm welcome to Mr. Keenan. He's helped us with some of these uh, exercises in the past. And uh, he'll be uh, talking to the uh, regulatory and planning framework and then um, once he's finished and you have asked him many questions uh, the uh, the presenters are left in the room are more than happy to answer any questions before we uh, sum up and finish well thank you mr carriage good morning mr keenan good afternoon. welcome again good afternoon commissioners Um, it's uh, nice to see the pair of you as well. Um, I, um, I haven't provided a statement of evidence in chief. I have not provided a rebuttal statement. Uh, I have some initial comments to make um, in yes. relation to my evidence in chief. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, now read uh, the rebuttal evidence and the other evidence in chief that wasn't available to me at that time. Just noting to you that I have read that. I have also reviewed the National Policy Statement for Freshwater 2020, and yes. I've reviewed the National Environmental Standards for Freshwater Regulations. The, um, I, I support the tailored approach proposed by the officers but I have noted in my evidence what I can see as being a way to differentiate between an extensive and an intensive vegetable rotation. 
I noted uh, just in one thing in the evidence of uh, uh, Trina Davidson for Naitahu, uh, concern about controlled activities that I wish yes. to address. Um, yes. Because uh, Ms Davidson raises a very good point about notification and the uh, presence of cultural values. So I've been thinking about that in terms of what evidence I have provided. And uh, I've, I've, I'm of the view that if the science evidence is accepted of uh, Potatoes New Zealand around the effect of the nutrient leaching, I consider that uh, the activities are going to occur mostly on land which has, or if almost entirely on land which has already been cultivated, is unlikely to uh, impact more than the existing activity on those cultural values. So I just do note that in terms of the uh, points that have been provided. So assuming you can accept the science evidence of PNZ regarding the effect of the nitrate discharges from potato, potato production, I think a controlled activity is a, a viable pathway for regulating the industry. Uh, this has been accepted in recent hearings by officers, um, the Section 42A report for the Horizons hearings that we have uh, just conducted has noted a controlled activity is acceptable for new activities in a non-target catchment in the Horizons region and acceptable for existing activities in the targeted catchments. A controlled activity has also been accepted in the Waikato uh, region in the PC1, although I note that both of those plan changes have occurred with slightly different regulatory regimes than the regime which is being applied here in Canterbury. For example, the Waikato process is influenced by the vision and strategy for the Waikato River, which is uh, has the equivalency or um, is, is, is a higher order planning document and has uh, weight over the top of the MPS freshwater. And in the case of the Horizons 1 plan, they have elected not to implement the MPS 2017 as part of their planning decisions. So I'm not certain that either of those planning decisions are relevant to your considerations. I was going to ask you that. Uh, so um, I also acknowledge that um, there has been a uh, there's a number of things that the PNZ submission is trying to achieve. The first thing is the license to operate in terms of the rural production activity of growing potatoes. This is usually conducted from what I can see in an enterprise concept and that enterprise concept is either occurring, occurring locally within a water management zone or a water management area, uh, a nutrient management area, or it's occurring across multiple nutrient management areas and more in a group. I've noted the provisions that provide for collective management for irrigation schemes in the Canterbury planning documents, and I think that if the accounting, the freshwater accounting matters can be appropriately dealt with in terms of the diligence which is provided with an application for consent. Uh, that could be that you could consent an enterprise across multiple water uh, nutrient management areas as a restricted discretionary activity, with the matters of discretion being targeted at the accounting arrangements to ensure that there is no, uh, there's no, there's no offending of the freshwater objectives for each nutrient management area. The restricted discretionary activity is also seeking to provide for a collective approach uh, along the lines of an irrigation scheme but far more targeted at managing quality provisions. 
and that is the reason for our adjusted uh, the the adjusted uh, Schedule 7 material which has been added into my evidence and was in the original submission for Potatoes New Zealand. And I have basically worked my way through the discretionary and non-complying and prohibited activity rules <coughs> much along the same lines as the officers have in the Section 42A report. And that's all I wish to say. I'm happy to answer your questions. Well, one of the reasons why we uh, welcome you uh, warmly, Mr. Keenan, because you you bring a uh, a constructive attitude to the evidence that you're able to give. Thank you, Commissioner Van Voorhisen. Would you like to ask questions of Mr. Keenan? Yes, thank you, Commissioner Shepherd, Mr. Keenan, and just um, three or four matters I'd just like to ask you about. First of all, though, could you please provide a word copy of your evidence? Um, to us via the hearings administrator. Um, first question, really I just want to confirm in my mind something that derives from your paragraph 76, so it's um, the rule 45.42 capital CA. And I know that in your evidence um, you suggest some amendments to various definitions etc, but would I be correct in assuming that the main outcome that Potatoes New Zealand is seeking is for this rule to be a controlled activity? or is it Maybe not the main. Is that one of the primary aims of the, the overall submission? I think there's, there's, there's three things that it's trying to achieve. Um, the, the way that I've tackled it is by looking firstly at the definitions and the definition of commercial vegetable growing, I think, can be uh, changed slightly to uh, differentiate between extensive and intensive rotations. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then also, uh, I'm also very aware of the problematic situation with the baseline commercial vegetable growing area. So I think that the cleanest way to address this, given the environmental footprint of the potato production as demonstrated, and I accept the evidence that's been put in front of me in regards to that, that uh, the cleanest way to deal with the commercial baseline area is to have a date of notification of the plan as for the existing and to try and enable or incentivise the expansion of that footprint onto the better soils across the, district, the, the, the districts in the region uh, through the incorporation of class one and two because from the expert evidence I've seen it appears that those soils are the most resilient and the best able to cope with it. I have been advised by growers that those soils are not always available, so I consider that it is important that the rule uh, provides um, um, no penalty for an existing farmer to actually have or, or, or lease and it can potentially be seen as assisting them in managing their own footprint. So the controlled activity rule is yes, to provide a controlled activity licence um, for that. Uh, the uh, reason why I cannot support a permitted activity is because of previous High Court decisions that have uh, gone in this, in this way. Plus I also believe that the complexity of the activity requires a closer relationship with the regulator. And I think that the points that uh, you raised, Commissioner Van Voorthuizen, earlier about uh, the good management practices that could be adopted, the uh, need to plant cover crops uh, soon after the uh, harvest of the potatoes and things like that, I think are, are relevant considerations for a council officer in uh, looking at uh, how they judge an assessment of environmental effects and how they set matters of control as part of that. <coughs> All right, and so in, in that answer you mentioned um, the baseline area and, and your suggestion that it be linked to the date of notification of the plan, and I guess that might address an issue that one of the growers, I think, um, relayed to us earlier that they commenced <laughs> their operations after the, the baseline area date that's currently being used, so I understand that. And I assume from your evidence if, if that was to occur, then in terms of expansion into areas not currently utilised, you're comfortable that restricted discretionary activity is appropriate for that. Sorry, can you repeat that, just this last part of 
Is that yeah. a question? <coughs> yeah, I'm just looking at your paragraph 80 where you're recommending a restricted discretionary activity. So, so in terms of the restricted discretionary activity, um, I'm suggesting it for the um, uh, operation across multiple nutrient management areas mm -hmm. uh, to provide the accounting certainty um, around that um, and also as a collective. So if an enterprise was to establish it was a legal entity and was capable of holding a consent for on behalf of a number of growing operations to manage the environmental uh, environmental systems in a in a comprehensive way. I think that that would require a closer review, and that links through to my Schedule Seven material. I think a restricted activity, a discretionary activity, is appropriate in that status. I believe that in most situations, a controlled activity should be appropriate if the activity is confined to a single nutrient management area. Yeah, so I didn't ask you a very good question, so I'll just ask you a different <laughs> question now. So in terms of your recommendation there at paragraph 80, and in terms of an RD rule and your reference there um, to the baseline area, that's contingent on, on the date for that being moved to... Yes, yes it is. Yeah, yes yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. I, I, I can't see I can't see too many ways to deal with it as in, 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 in simply, simply, given uh, the the layering of the plan through the um, each each water management subzone. Uh, it's it's in my view the cleanest way to do it is to do it in the definition. I certainly would not be suggesting it if I had evidence that the potato production footprint was elevated above the scale of other activities that exist. Yeah. And just a um, further matter, just in terms of the evidence then that's been presented um, in terms of the leaching rate um, below the potato crop, the year that the crop's in the ground, you know, zero ten kgs of N per hectare per year, which is a very low rate compared to other forms of land use, I assume then um, you wouldn't envisage any problems with um, having to meet baseline GMP leaching rates for new areas that are being moved into? So I think that um, I've covered um, this to a certain amount is that the, 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 the baseline um, leaching rate which is being applied for in these new areas is, is often sufficient to mm -hmm. actually provide for um, you know, it's 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 the other activities within the in the catchment are more than sufficient to provide, and in particular, I think uh, that the most likely uh, target for that will be dairy support or dairy. Okay. And uh, but I think that when looking at all of the other activities, the baseline. Um, for moving into those new areas is appropriate. Yeah, yeah, good. That's what I understood from the evidence too. Um, just moving on. Yeah, this um, Schedule Seven B in this rotation management plan, and you, you've recommended extensive provisions there. Um, I'm really just struggling with seeing the utility or the value that would add to the plan if we were to be favourably minded to consider the amendments to the definitions, mm. policies and rules that you've provided, mm. what extra bang for our buck would we get from putting this extensive suite of provisions into Schedule 7B? Yeah, so uh, what, 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 um, uh, what uh, I, I was asked to do uh, is um, part of my role uh, was to design a comprehensive uh, plan for the potato sector across New Zealand. Right. And part of the approach that we have chosen to do is to try and systemise the environmental response. So having having a having a very, in my view, what this consistent set of provisions that we are providing across all plans in the country does is it provides a framework for the industry to support growing by providing a very targeted environmental management system to address the concerns that, uh, that that the community does have around farming activities. So 
uh, I, I could, can appreciate your concern at putting this extensive suite of, uh, of conditions in. I do um, draw your attention to uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the rotation, uh, the, 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 the parts that come under the vegetable growing minimum standards. Uh, which is the part D that I have put in, which is about a rotation management plan, yeah. because that is more applicable to a collective, and that is what we're thinking about is the potential pathway if you were looking at, say if McCain's grower group wanted to do a collective consent and provide for a, a, a holistic approach to their environmental management. How you could do that uh, and still provide the regulatory assurances that are necessary to ensure that either an individual could be targeted for enforcement action or the collective could be targeted if that was the case. I think you uh, probably want something in there that speaks to how that collective would work. Okay. So I think <coughs> at least that part is useful to you. Okay. So just in terms of the notes I'm taking, then in terms of your evidence to us and, and the changes that on behalf of Potatoes New Zealand you're suggesting, um, in terms of Schedule 7D, Part D is, is pretty important and the rest might be put in the nice to have rather than the essential category. Would that be a fair kind of overview? Well, well apart from the fact that I think that the way that the, the, the parts of Schedule D, um, Schedule 7 that we have suggested are constructed are very targeted around a rotational practice, whereas most of the uh, most of, most of the farm planning schedules that we see in plans have arrived from a, a, a more pastoral focus, uh, and uh, you can get the rotate at the rotation within them, but you don't necessarily come directly to it. And that's all I have for you. I did have some further questions about the baseline growing area. I oh, know it's not, it's not, that's what I'm calling it. It's not called that in the plan, but we've addressed that in terms of my earlier questions to you. So thank you very much for your evidence. Thank you. Helpful. That's all, Commissioner so Shepard, for me. Questions, Mr. Keenan. Uh, paragraph 45 of your evidence. You're telling us about some evidence that was given on PC1 by somebody called Andrew Barber. Ah, uh, yes, he's an uh, expert in this process as well. Well, he may be, but he's not a witness in this proceeding. Is it acceptable for the commissioners in this proceeding to receive the evidence of Mr Barber if it wasn't lodged as directed to this proceeding so that other submitters can Rebuttal. It's not acceptable for you to accept evidence given on another process uh, that is not immediately available um, within this process because other people would not have the chance to comment on it who are actively involved in this process. Mr Barber, Mr. Barber is actively involved in this process. Uh, but his evidence, his evidence does not cover this particular thing, I understand, in this process. Yeah. Yes. Paragraph 54. You're talking about the CRPS, and you tell us that Objective 15.2.1 refers specifically to certain things. <coughs> Yes, I should have put that in my evidence, shouldn't I? I, um, I initially read that as meaning uh, objective 521. But it doesn't well, it must, suck. It must be 521, yes. Yes, because I was reading it and it must be an error in my evidence. Yes. Um, because I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm certain if I looked, there's no 1521 in the in, in, in the RPS. Well, there is, but it's on another topic. Yes. <laughs> it's cut to 521. Location, design and function of development. 
Does that refer specifically to the matters that you talk about of maintenance of soil quality? Because I couldn't find it, so I wasn't able to follow you. Uh, can I just um, move to that um, before I answer your question? Yeah, of course. Yes. Page 31 of the RPS. Yes. I should have had it downloaded and waited. I'm sorry. <laughs> well. You might have missed something on the final editing of your evidence. Well, well, I, I think that the, the well five. I am definitely referring to five two one in paragraph fifty four. So the first, yes. that's the first thing. Um, and what I have done is 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 looked at objective that, five two one. Reminds. Sorry. What I've done is looked at objective five two one, focusing on um, you know the overall design and function and location for the region. Uh, and so the objective specific, seeking to enable activities that support the rural production environment in those rural zonings. I'm still waiting for that to download. Sorry. Um, wow. Has anyone got a copy of the IPs? Nope. It's all right. Oh. It's just about done. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big document. So the, the part one of 521 talks about um, existing urban areas. And then part the two part two of 521 in the objectives uh, does include enabling rural activities as E that support the rural environment, including primary production. Yes. But your evidence is that it refers specifically, by which I suppose you mean by words, to the maintenance of soil quality. No, it doesn't. Um, it, it doesn't. It and I couldn't find that there. That might be an error in my evidence because I was referring uh, to... So the soil, the soil, um, uh, I did cover the soil uh, uh, matters. I just need to work out where I have done it. I did look at well, this when I went through. Thank you much question as well, Mr. Keenan, while you, you might like to think about that a bit further. But my next question is similar. In the next paragraph, it's really evident, paragraph 55, you say the RPS provides a strong direction to maintain or improve the productive capacity of soil. 
And I don't know where that is either. Um, five. Five three two, which is the policy. Five three two. I. No, it's objective okay. fifteen twenty two uh, five two one. Fifteen. Is it gone down? Is it? Oh. I did look at this quite carefully. Sorry, uh, uh, Commissioner. <coughs> Commissioner, but it has been a little time ago that I covered it. Is that the? That's the. Where's the? Where's the uh, We are going to take a lunch break. Yes, can I just have a moment to um, uh, follow this through because it does appear I've created a bit of a tangle for you, Commissioner, and I apologise yeah. for that. I will well, sort it out. And We're not looking for heads, we're just looking to get it clarified. Yes. <laughs> and uh, if you'd like to, to give it some thought over the lunch break and you can uh, give what, what further answer you'd like to it uh, is when the, we resume at two o'clock. It's it's yeah, and it isn't an error in the objective. It does actually refer to objective fifteen two one, and uh, that is um, I will follow on up on that after the lunch break. Yes, I think that's the best thing. Thank you. So we're, we'll resume at uh, two o'clock, and uh, you will have the opportunity then to say what more you would like in response to those questions, and then. Um, Mr. Claridge can say what he would like to 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 uh, complete the presentation before we come to the federated farmers who will be waiting on your heels. So adjourned until two o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a following policy to implement this objective. Policy five three one five three two and five three eleven. And that's what I found. Uh, Leave me to sort that out. And, uh, yes, you can.